So today we're going to talk about keyboard music in the teaching studio. Um, throughout history, professional musicians have worked as teachers. Teaching has been an essential way for them to earn income, whether they are teaching children, or teaching adult amateur musicians, or teaching the next generation of professional musicians. Um, today, we're going to look at a range of keyboard music from across two centuries, from Johann Sebastian Bach in uh, the 1720s to Bella Bartok in the 1930s, to understand how composers wrote music for the teaching studio, um, often for their own pupils to use. And I think at the outset, we need to realize that a lot of keyboard music has survived for posterity purely because it was written down for teaching. Until the end of the 18th century, most keyboard music was improvised on the spot in the performance. And some keyboardists refused to write down their improvisations because they didn't want to disclose the secrets of their art to anybody else. There was a stereotype of the secretive, jealous keyboardist, um, someone who deliberately played badly before an audience when they thought there might be some people in the audience who could steal some aspects of their performance technique. So we have that stereotype, which we'll come back to, of the secretive keyboardist. But when keyboardists had pupils, um, and those pupils would have paid a large sum of money, um, the keyboardists would normally write down samples of their improvisations as examples for the pupils. So many of Bach's keyboard works originated as models that he wrote down for his pupils, as inspiration for their own improvisations. And then his pupils copied those manuscripts, um, and they were recopied by their pupils and recopied down the generations. And eventually, this music by Bach has reached us entirely because it was used in teaching over the generations. So we must thank the practices of the teaching studio for the survival of a lot of the keyboard music of the 17th and 18th century. In this lecture, we're going to see how composers across the generations have approached the challenge of writing keyboard pieces um, for use in teaching. One frequent characteristic of these pieces is that they are graded. You start with easy pieces and then you move to harder ones. Another characteristic is that these pieces incorporate particular aspects of keyboard technique. So, for instance, um, in Bach, it's very important that he teaches his pupils how to play different independent contrapuntal lines and make each of them kind of sing out in their own way. But by the 19th century, for composers like uh, Chopin and Liszt, it's much more learning massive physical virtuosity, um, the, the technique to be able to play arpeggios and scales that go right across the keyboard. And we'll also look at some 20th century examples by Bartok, where he's teaching his pupils to learn the ethnic styles of Hungarian music and also some of the complex rhythmic patterns used in contemporary music. So we'll see in these examples how the aims of keyboard education, these aims have changed so much over the years um, as styles of playing have changed, as keyboard playing has become more virtuosic, and also as musical tastes have changed themselves. So for the rest of the lecture, we're going to be focusing on the pieces which are named in your program, um, and I will introduce the composer and say a little bit about what we know about them as teachers, and then Florian will play the pieces, um, sometimes giving little excerpts of interesting moments from the piece for you to listen out for um, before he plays uh, the complete piece or a large chunk of it. So our first composer today is J.S. Bach. Um, 
working as a teacher in central Germany in the early 18th century. And here he was teaching a whole succession of keyboard pupils, his sons, um, schoolboys in Leipzig, and also adolescent musicians from across Germany who would come to work and study with Bach because he was known as one of the finest keyboard players of his day. Almost all his pupils were male, almost all were boys um, or young men, apart from a few exceptions, such as his second wife, Anna Magdalena, and possibly some of his daughters. He may have taught a few girls if they were within his family, um, but otherwise he was just teaching um, uh, all male pupils. Most of his pupils were learning um, 18th century keyboard instruments, the harpsichord and the organ, mainly because these were instruments that they would then use as musical directors rather than as keyboard soloists. So um, an 18th century musician who was a conductor, um, rather than standing up in front of the orchestra um, waving a baton um, or tapping his foot, would uh, instead sit at the keyboard at the harpsichord and play the keyboard accompaniment known as continuo and would direct the orchestra from the keyboard. So in the 18th century, learning the keyboard is as much about becoming a music director as it is about becoming um, a, a sort of virtuoso solo musician. Bach taught his pupils um, via a system rather like apprenticeships, so similar to how people would have learnt um, crafts such as metalworking or carpentry. Um, the pupil would go and live with Bach for several years and would completely absorb his routine and would also help him with everyday tasks, which might include copying out music. Uh, it might also include um, looking after children, changing their nappies, and um, cleaning the house, to judge from some satirical accounts of uh, the early 18th century. I have um, a quotation here from a letter by one of Bach's first pupils, uh, a man called Philip David Kreuter, who studied with Bach in 1712. And this is what Kreuter wrote about learning with Bach. Quote, he is an excellent and sterling man, both in composition and in instruction on keyboard and other instruments. It is assuredly six hours per day of guidance that I receive from him, primarily in composition and on the keyboard, and at times also on other instruments. The rest of the time I use by myself for practice and copying, since he shares with me all the music I ask for. I am also at liberty to look through all of his pieces. And that's the end of a quotation. And there are lots of really interesting things here. First of all, he says that he has six hours of guidance from Bach a day. Now, Bach had a full-time job as an organist, so clearly this pupil wasn't having six hours of what we would nowadays think as kind of concentrated one-to-one -one music lessons. He was more like an intern who was shadowing Bach, following him around in his routine and learning by observation. And notice also that Kreuter praised Bach for sharing all the music that uh, he asked for, and he said he was at liberty to look through all of Bach's own compositions. So this is a contrast with that stereotype I mentioned earlier of, of the secretive keyboardist who believes that their, their musical art is like alchemy and they're not going to share it with anyone else. And I think Bach was actually quite unusual in being such a generous teacher um, in his day. Bach was also very famous for an unusual approach to keyboard technique, and this is recorded by his first biographer, somebody called Johann Nicolas Forkel. Um, Forkel said, quote, the first thing Bach did was to teach his keyboard pupils his peculiar modes of touching the instrument. For this purpose, he made them practice for months on end, nothing but isolated exercises for all the fingers of both hands, with constant regard to a clear and clean touch. 
So the poor pupils weren't allowed to play proper pieces. They just had to do finger exercises. But once they had done those finger exercises, the pupils would be allowed to uh, learn some of Bach's own compositions that he had written himself for teaching. And today we're going to focus on some pieces that Bach wrote called The Inventions. Uh, these were part of a keyboard book uh, he wrote for his firstborn son, Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, in the 1720s, uh, when his son, Wilhelm Friedemann, was about 10 years old. So the sort of age that a lot of uh, people still these days start to learn uh, keyboard instruments. The book for W.F. Bach is a graded book. Remember, I mentioned grading is one of these characteristics of keyboard collections. It's graded from easy to hard. It starts off with some of those very simple exercises, um, finger exercises, and then it moves to contrapuntal pieces, um, such as these inventions. And according to Bach's title page, he thought that the inventions should do two things for the pupils. First of all, they should teach a singing style in performance. And then also, they should give a foretaste of composition. So what does he mean by singing style in performance? How can one make a keyboard sing? Particularly if you think that in the early 18th century, it would have been the harpsichord um, that uh, Bach's pupils were playing, and which often people think isn't a very singable uh, cantabile instrument. Thomas Beecham famously compared the harpsichord to tin skeletons copulating on a, on a metal roof. Um, so I, I think the singing style, what he means here is that this music consists of two independent lines and he wants the keyboardist to bring out the little figures in each of those lines. Um, and that, so when the figure is in the right hand, you need to bring it out. When it's in the left hand, you need to bring it out. When it's in both hands, simultaneously. You want to make it singable, logical music. And Bach uses little keyboard figures that fit easily under the hands. So in contrast with the pieces that we'll show you later, it's not massive virtuosity that spans the whole register of the keyboard. These figures fit very nicely under four or five fingers. So we're going to do two pieces. Um, the first piece is the C major invention. And Florian will first of all just play the, um, the little figure that Bach uses as the basis of the piece, it's just sort of fitting under the, under the fingers. And then he'll play the whole of the C major invention. Thank you, Florian. And our second piece um, is the B-flat major invention um, from this same book. And here, again, there's a little rhythmic figure 
um, that Bach takes as the basis, and you'll hear this figure um, appearing in both hands, sometimes in dialogue between the right hand and the left hand, sometimes the two hands together near the end where it reaches a climax. And again, Florian will play you just that little rhythmic figure first so you can hear it. Um, on its own, and then listen through it. Every beat of the music, we have this rhythmic figure somewhere in the texture. It's very typical Bach to saturate the music with one rhythmic figure. Thank you, Florian. And remember that Bach said those pieces are not just for learning performance, but also for learning composition. And this is perhaps the last um, moment in the history of keyboard playing when um, the, these didactic pieces were intended both to teach performance and also composition. From now on um, in our lecture, we'll be looking at pieces which are more designed to teach performance techniques. Um, but it's worth remembering that even today, um, for instance, my undergraduate students at Royal Holloway, um, they look at um, those Bach inventions as models of composition and try to um, sometimes even compose in that style, which is actually a, a, an awful, terrible challenge um, to do. Um, but uh, it shows that these teaching pieces by Bach still have uh, immense value as pedagogical material um, almost three centuries after they were written, which is a, a sort of testament to the enduring power of Bach's music. We're now going to move onwards. We're going to move about 50 years forward in history, and we're going to move from Leipzig um, and central Germany, and we're going to move to Vienna and Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Um, Mozart was known throughout his lifetime as a keyboard virtuoso as well as um, a composer. Um, in fact, when he was shown off as an infant prodigy um, by his father Leopold, it was as much for his amazing playing as a, as a kind of five or six year old as also for his ability even at that age to write simple music as a composer. Mozart was very active as a, a piano teacher and here we see a shift away from the apprentice, apprenticeship system, the all-male apprenticeships uh, that Bach uh, was working within. Um, instead, Mozart is typically going into the drawing rooms of aristocratic houses to teach the young ladies of the family um, piano playing as a polite, feminine accomplishment. And I've got here a letter uh, Mozart wrote in 1777 describing um, his teaching one of these young ladies. Um, and he writes, uh, quote, I have told her that if I were her regular teacher, I would lock up all her music, cover the keys with a handkerchief, and make her practice first with the right hand and then with the left Nothing but passages, trills, mordants, and so forth, very slowly at first, 
until each hand should be thoroughly trained. Um, so this interesting idea that the keys would be covered up and that the focus would be just on the hands and not actually seeing where the hands fitted onto the keys. Um, and the piece of Mozart that we're going to focus on is uh, his sonata in C major, K545, uh, which he finished in June 1788. And the reason we've chosen this is that in his catalogue of his works, Mozart described it as a sonata for beginners which is in a way a bit of a deceptive title because although it shows many of the, you know, it's a piece that requires an, a novice player to tackle many challenges, it is also very difficult to play successfully. Um, so I'll just first of all point out some of the different challenges in these, in the first few bars of, of the piece before Florian plays it um, as a complete, uh, well, uh, he'll play a minute or two of it in a moment. But first of all, a few extracts to listen out for. So the piece starts in the very first bar with a singing right hand melody um, over quite a busy bass line, an Alberti bass, and where the, the left hand has this kind of broken chord figure, um, which sounds a bit like this. And Florian, uh, do you want to tell us a bit about the challenge for a, uh, a young player of playing that sort of texture? Yes, um, I uh, have actually tried to teach this piece to one of my, uh, one of my pupils. Uh, and um, um, initially I thought they would be uh, put off by the, the scales that follow in the arpeggios, which are very fiddly and, and, and require lots of practice, but actually most of them uh, wanted to just quit from the, the beginning because uh, it's the, the, the thing that you get first is this. Obviously, because the left hand is very busy, it moves very, you know, moves quite a lot, and 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 it's quite quite a di difficult figure to get. Um, and and the same the same problem comes in one of the great two pieces of the current syllab the piano syllabus of the ABRSM. Uh, it's last in, in C measure as well, and you get this instead of. So it's it's quite difficult to um, uh, to to actually explain how to do that, uh, and and then comes the, this figure which you want to fit those two notes with exactly the last quaver, but not you don't want them to you want to be you want them to close, and then when the trill comes in at the end, that's the end of the world. You know how many trills do I do? How many? So that 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 is really really difficult, and we are only four bars within the sonata facile. <laughs> Called, called uh, um, and then, um, and, and of course, you can apply this to. Uh, you, obviously, if you if you manage to master these problems in the first four bars, then you know the rest becomes easily more a bit easier because uh, it, it comes again in in the recapitulation. But it is it is a very very difficult mm. challenge, <laughs> a, a really difficult opening as well for yeah. I think anyone. And then after those four bars, Mozart puts in another technical challenge, which is um, delicate scales in the right hand, a bit like this. So the, the pianist now suddenly has to go from the right hand being a singing melody to being very dexterous and with all those notes kind of um, light and, and directed up the scale. And then a few bars later in bar 13, there's another challenge. Now the left hand has this sort of busy oscillating figure, almost like a, a sort of angry fly trapped in a, in a window or something, above which the right hand floats a delicate melody. So again, a challenge to present in a cantabile singing manner. And then immediately after that, Mozart goes into a dialogue between the two hands playing arpeggios. So now stretching out the hands um, using um, all five fingers rather than the very close work we've had earlier. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I think the, the really clever thing that Mozart does is he brings all these technical challenges into a, a musical texture, which is quite kaleidoscope. It's like a kaleidoscope because it changes every three or four bars from one thing to another. And yet there's always a, a thread of musical logic going through it. Um, so it's a coherent piece. It's not just a series of different technical challenges. Um, so this is what the, the first um, minute or so of the piece sounds like. I do remember I, when I did learn this piece as a student, and I, I don't remember much about that time, but I do remember that this, this busy left hand that you mentioned was so hard because it, it's not a trill, so it has to be extremely controlled and, and even, and very, very even, but also very much in the background. So I remember the muscles going really stiff, and, and it, was, it was really difficult to sort of relax and, and, and not, not get a sort of cramped hand. Uh, because, you know, it, it's just, especially, you know, it, get, it gets into this sort of um, uh, technical change where it, the fingers are actually unable to move because of the stiffness in the muscles. So that, that, that made it all, all more difficult. And, and then, of course, you, you, you try to practice and then when you actually play the piece, not think about it because you want to phrase the left hand in a nice, beautiful, musical way that actually people enjoy listening to. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just play the exposition and the development after the, um, uh, the uh, so-called recapitulation, which actually comes in F major, so it's a fake recapitulation, but that encapsulates everything that, that, that is difficult and challenging in this opening movement. Thank you very much. So perhaps Mozart was playing a cruel joke when he said this was a sonata for beginners, um, but more likely it was a realistic, um, uh, you know, putting, putting beginners through every technical challenge they were likely to encounter in late 18th century keyboard music. So we now move into the 19th century and we move to the figure of Carl Czerny, who, although not a household name in the way that Bach and Mozart um, are, um, a very significant figure in uh, the kind of history of keyboard playing and particularly the writing of didactic material. Czerny was a pupil of Beethoven, um, and then he himself became a teacher of many 19th century pianists, including Franz Liszt, um, who uh, we'll, we'll encounter in more detail later on. So you can see Czerny as a kind of link between uh, the Viennese classics of the late 18th century and then into the virtuoso pianists of the 19th century. But unlike figures like Chopin and Liszt, Czerny chose to spend his career not as a traveling virtuoso, but as a teacher and a composer. And in fact, he claimed that he gave 12 lessons a day, um, 12 hour long lessons, um, starting at 8 a.m. and finishing at 8 p.m. Um, so um, clearly in uh, contravention of European directives on working hours and so forth. 
Czerny is significant uh, because he wrote many studies or exercises, um, and this indicates a real change in keyboard teaching that is occurring at this time, um, rather than the pieces being sonatas, um, or, or uh, in Bach's case, various contrapuntal pieces. Um, now we have this genre of the study or the etude or the exercise, which in its very title tells you that it's about um, learning um, a particular keyboard technique. And um, Czerny is very much moving more to explore systematically a technical problem. So one study will explore a particular technical problem uh, for, for the hands, um, as opposed to Mozart, who kind of threw so many different challenges into just the space of about one minute of music. So it's a now a, a, a much more systematic um, way of teaching. Um, you might almost see it as a slightly industrialized method along the lines of the kind of um, introduction of various industrialized processes uh, that were happening at the start of the 19th century. Um, so I think Florian is going to tell us a bit about your experience of um, using these Czerny etudes in your own um, piano studies. Um, I do remember as uh, my first piano teacher tried to um, uh, introduce me to this world of, of technical exercises. So the first um, book we looked at was the, the famous Hannon, the virtuoso pianist uh, book. And I, I didn't really warm up to those exercises. That, and I think, looking back now, I think it's because what Hannon does is sacrificing everything for the sake of the technical problems. So, you know, one of the simplest... <laughs> You just go up the keyboard and down doing this, and then at the end, uh, absolutely no uh, um, maybe musical input into it because really, you know, I have a problem with making my five fingers play very evenly, very strongly, very clearly articulating. So I'm just going to do that and not care about phrasing, um, musicality, or any, any of that. So I, I, as a child, I didn't quite. Um, like practicing them and, and, and it never really worked. And then we looked into Czerny and suddenly I, I actually liked, I, I really liked um, practicing them and I even asked my teacher, you know, has he written anything like sonatas and concerto? And, and the, 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 the answer was that he actually did, but they're not, they're not really good because he wasn't necessarily a great composer, but his studies are amazing and I think he was arguably maybe one of the best piano teachers um, ever. Uh, there is literally no problem of piano playing that he doesn't have a study for. You know, double notes, octaves, arpeggios, um, uh, scales, any sort of finger pattern that you can think of, there is a study for it. Um, and my favorite collection was the Opus 299, nicknamed, or actually not nicknamed, it was, it was a proper title called The School of Velocity. And that title says everything. I'm, I'm just going to make this sort of five fingers for each hand play quickly, uh, very sparkly, very articulating, and um, uh, going back to the, the the musical sort of aspect, it's very basic uh, m musical musicality in these pieces, but they do just make a whole difference. I, I, I tried to introduce this studies to one of my, my my young pupils, and they said, "Oh, it's it's like it's like an opera, it's like a song," and it truly is because it draws from the uh, the the sort of vocal quality of, of, of Mozart, and, and he generally knew both Mozart and Beethoven, so uh, it's, it's not so far away from music, and what I like is that, you know, it, it grows, it, it comes, uh, it, it transcends this, makes this transition between pure technique and music, and one of the studies that I wanted to um, play an extract for you is, um, you know, going back to the problem of voicing. Uh, between the two hands at the beginning of the, the C major Mozart sonata. Uh, at study number 10, Czerny does this. So if you thought the beginning of the Mozart was hard, you know, you try. But the thing is, if you manage to play this study, when you come to the, 
it will feel much more easier. So Cherny has achieved his purpose. He's taught you to voice nicely between the two hands. With, uh, it's the, the left hand is named, uh, is, is, is written, is indicated piano, and the right hand is con anima, is this sort of big, uh, excited melody that has to, and, and sometimes it's just this. That ha and it, that has to prevail over all this really busy left hand. So uh, that, that's why I like, like Cherny very, very much, because there, there, there are things in, in his studies that you can take and put into real music. Uh, and, 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 and then what, if you practice this, when you go and, and do the Mozart, you don't have to practice those four bars, because actually you've, achieved, you've got the skills to do it. You, you've already um, been taught how to do it. But then, of course, he's probably most famous uh, studies are the five finger exercises, these iconic going up and down from finger one to finger five uh, and down many, many, many times in uh, many sort of uh, uh, ways or some other sort of variations. Uh, I mean, this, this was so powerful that if, if, when we look at the Debussy studies, the first study, Pour la Saint Doa, starts like this. And it's, uh, it says, you know, um, après Monsieur Cherny. So, you know, it's, you know he, uh, Debussy acknowledges that the inspiration uh, of the particular study. So I'm going to play for you uh, study number nine from the School of Velocity, which is um, very much about, um, you know, what, how difficult can I make this five-finger pattern, uh, but that in order to, um, to actually teach the fingers play very nicely. And actually, you know, I, maybe it would be interesting to, I chose this one because he has lots of uh, humor in it, lots of unexpected modulations, so there is music to it, uh, not just bare scales. to play more of the other one, the F major one? I, I, I wasn't going to, but if you want me to, I could. <laughs> um, I think we've got time if you want to play a, a yeah, little, a little sure. bit of it. Yes. No, I can, so I can, yeah, this is the number 10, uh, the one with a very busy left hand. Thank you. 
So just as the Industrial Revolution allows people to specialise um, in the manufacture of things by working on a particular task to do it more efficiently, so did Cherney's exercises allow pianists to really finesse their playing by working on particular technical exercises systematically. Um, so you can see how the ways of keyboard teaching are changing um, in the social and economic climate of, of the 19th century. The status of musicians is also changing. Um, whereas in the 18th century, musicians like Bach, their main income had been as church musicians. Um, and although Mozart didn't quite ever manage to hold down a court or church post in the same way, um, in the 19th century, musicians were increasingly um, freelance uh, performers, and no more so than uh, piano virtuosos, such as Chopin and Liszt. So this takes us on to uh, our next two uh, names on your program. Um, Chopin uh, made his living through a variety of things, partly publishing his music, partly giving concert tours, but particularly by teaching. Um, when he lived in Paris, he was able to charge extremely um, large amounts of money um, to the uh, well, uh, high-class people in Paris, as well as professional musicians who wanted to have the prestigious um, experience of a piano lesson with Chopin. And Chopin, um, like Czerny, he wrote studies, or in his case, he calls them etudes. Um, but I think much more than Czerny, he is making of a technical study into a serious musical and artistic statement, um, making it suitable for use in the concert hall. Um, uh, I don't think really anyone would uh, try to put together a concert program of uh, studies by Czerny, but it is certainly possible to have a concert of studies and etudes by Chopin and Liszt. Today we're going to look at uh, Chopin's Opus 25 etudes, which were written in the 1830s. They are 12 pieces, each quite short, each about two minutes long, um, and each addresses one technical problem of keyboard playing. And the piece that Florian is going to play is the climax to this set of 12. And it has arpeggios in both hands. So it's a real dramatic statement that brings this cycle of 12 etudes to a close. You can imagine it being a very effective um, end of concert uh, sort of showpiece. But it's not just about arpeggios, these kind of big, uh, you know, uh, technical showpiece. Um, in this piano figuration, we start to hear um, a chorale melody, so this slow hymn-like melody, slightly funereal, actually. Um, so that's something slightly unexpected emerging from what might seem at first to be a technical study, but it has um, something quite evocative from this dark, um, low-register melody.
Thank you. And only a few years after Chopin was writing that etude, um, Franz Liszt started writing his own etudes. Um, and with Liszt, um, like Chopin, he is a virtuoso pianist, but his compositions, whereas Chopin values a certain delicacy and poetic power, um, Liszt often aims solely at virtuosity, um, often virtuosity when he is reworking someone else's music. So he reworks music by Bach, he reworks music um, by other 19th century composers, and he reworks music by uh, the violin virtuoso violinist Paganini, um, as in the case of uh, one of these Paganini etudes, which we are about to hear. So Paganini was a virtuoso violinist who went around Europe um, kind of bewitching his audiences with the mystery and virtuosity of his playing. And he was cultivating myths that he was somehow demonic or kind of vaguely related to the devil, um, which is actually a recurrent myth with, with violinists. But Paganini quite enjoyed using this in his, in his uh, publicity material. Um, and where Liszt was clearly very inspired by Paganini's virtuosity and he reworked many of Paganini's themes um, into his own music. For instance, the theme from the finale of one of Paganini's violin concertos uh, becomes uh, one of Liszt's etudes on a theme by Paganini. And today uh, we're going to hear uh, uh, an etude which is based on a Paganini capriccio. And it's interesting, um, the... The Paganini piece is very virtuosic in itself, uh, but Liszt clearly wants to make it even more virtuosic by adding all the extra capabilities of the piano, um, the wider register, the ability to play um, octaves in both hands, all sorts of things that a violinist alone can't do, not even a violinist as um, special as Paganini. So you'll hear that this um, etude um, starts with a dramatic introduction and then it goes into an andantino section which contrasts between these rapid downward scales and then also there are chords um, that sort of have a kind of melody in them down below. And then Florin will go into a, a section called the animato where there is uh, octave writing in the left hand and a slightly contrapuntal texture, but clearly a big technical challenge uh, with all those octaves. Do you want me to play all of it or...? Well, do you want to go to the end of the animato okay. section? I haven't okay. got time. Okay. Yeah, we've got time for that, yes.
From that 19th century virtuosity, we now come to something more neoclassical in the work of Bella Bartok. Um, composers in the 20th century also wrote keyboard music for teaching purposes, and one of those composers is Bartok, who taught piano at the Budapest Academy of Music um, in the 19, well, from 1907 till the 1930s. Now, um, in around 1910, Bartok had already written a keyboard collection called For Children, in which he um, offered keyboard arrangements of Hungarian folk songs. This was something really important to Bartok. He wanted to rediscover the Hungarian national music, and he did that by collecting uh, music from peasants and from you know, the countryside in Hungary, and then he went further out into Romania and Bulgaria in an attempt to recapture the indigenous roots of his country's music. Um, so but his collection for children is kind of teaching children about their, their um, Hungarian musical heritage um, and with these settings of folk songs. Um, but today we're going to concentrate on a collection of uh, keyboard pieces called Microcosmos, which Bartok completed in the 1930s. The early volumes of it were written for Bartok's son Peter, who was about uh, 10 years old at the time. So an interesting parallel with Bach uh, writing his keyboard book for W.F. Bach two centuries earlier. Um, and uh, Bartok actually took his son out of school music lessons because he felt that at home he could offer a much better music education than having his son um, sit through the class music lessons. So the title microcosmos has a dual meaning. It could mean um, like a microcosm. It could mean the musical world is here in miniature, everything that a, a student needs to know. Or it could also mean a musical world for little people, um, the sort of micro of the title for, for young pianists. So it's a graded collection of music. The first two books um, have very simple pieces, and Florian is going to play a little extract of uh, a piece from book two, where you'll hear um, Bartok uses a very distinctive um, folk-like melody in the right hand. It's in what's called the Lydian mode, unlike our modern scales, so it gives quite a primitive color to it. And then into book four, the pieces get harder. And I think we've only got a t time for perhaps a few bars from that um, adagio in book four. But here you'll hear how um, Bartok requires a, a, gentle left a gentle right hand against a much busier um, left hand part. <laughs> And then by book six, the pieces become really virtuosic, and these are really intended for professional pianists. In fact, um, uh, Florin is going to play um, a Bulgarian dance which Bartok dedicated to the professional pianist Harriet Cohen. And you will hear um, 
Bartok is using the unusual Bulgarian rhythms, what we call an additive rhythm, um, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Um, so it's quite a technical challenge for a pianist who may not be used to these um, exciting, driving, but irregular rhythms. And this will be the final um, piece of our lecture. <laughs> So in conclusion, you can see that the technical challenges in these keyboard pieces have changed over the years, from Bach teaching people how to um, project counterpoint to the rhythmic precision and ethnic styles of Bartok. But I hope you can see that these are not dry technical exercises. And actually, if it wasn't for teaching, a lot of these pieces would never have been written down in the first place. Thank you.